and that would have shattered his jaw completely. This dinosaur knows how to uh, knows how to break necks, which is interesting. Hi there, my name's Joe. I'm a paleontologist at the Natural History Museum in London and the University of Bath. And uh, we're going to be watching some scenes from the first and second Jurassic World films. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, so in this first clip, we've got some velociraptors who are being trained to follow commands. We've got some we've got some issues here, but let's see see what happens. So it, whether you could click a train a a Velociraptor, I highly doubt it. I don't think they were that intelligent. So Velociraptors were apex predators. They were strong, nimble, fast. They had perfect binocular vision. They had really great sensors. They were nowhere near as big as this. They were actually more like the size of a big feathered turkey. They would have been covered in feathers. That aside, their intelligence level was high, but perhaps not this high. I think with clicker training and sort of a rewards-based system, I think you're looking at more like mammals, some of the higher mammals. I think it's even quite difficult to, to clicker train mammals. Certainly dogs, maybe definitely not cats, if, if mine's anything to go by. The, the great apes, monkeys, dolphins, things like that, maybe. Velociraptors, I don't think, have the intelligence. You can see here as well, the velociraptors have all got their arms kind of like this with like wrists folded forward. In reality, it'd be more like out at the side, like they were holding a, a basketball or a football. That's how quickly they just went for him. So they were never fully trained. They were just waiting for an opportunity to for him to turn their turn their, his back to them, and they would have just eaten him anyway. So that just shows that you can't you can't train them. So the mosasaurs were around a uh, similar time to the dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs, they're a different group of marine reptiles. They did not get anywhere near the size of this. This is probably one of the biggest issues paleontologists have with this particular film, is the, the size exaggeration of the mosasaurs. So they got big, don't get me wrong. They were probably about the same size as a T-Rex, if not slightly smaller, which is still a big animal. The one you see here is, is about three or four times that size, so there's, there's no animal that we've ever found as big as, as this mosasaur is. Again, they, they could have genetically modified it and made it really big to be cool. Um, and it is cool. But yeah, they weren't this big in real life. And there it is. It can camouflage. To have an ability to camouflage that well, we only really see in mollusks like octopi. We don't know of any reptiles that can, other than the chameleon, that can kind of even get close to that really. I mean, this is a genetic mismatch of all sorts of animals, but that's not really how DNA works. You can't just put some fish DNA in a reptile and give it the properties. I mean, yeah, this this animal is kind of, I think they say the base of its DNA, the basic profile is a T-Rex. It's going to have a super strong bite. It's going to be able to see you, hear you, know when you're coming. And I don't think they really stood a chance unless they had really, really big guns, which the little taser things wouldn't have scratched the surface. You see, I told you. Welcome. So we've got a few ankylosaurs hanging out in the uh, in the forest here. As terms of reconstructions go, these are pretty accurate actually. Ankylosaurs is a big armored tank of a of a dinosaur. The ankylosaurs would have probably have smelt the Indominus Rex at this point. Now they've heard it, but they would have they would have known. You know, they still have acute senses of smell as well. So yeah, ankylosaurs had this big club on the end of their tail that they would swing. Um, to, this is really good behaviour that we can see. They would swing this club to try and stop a predator from from attacking them and eating them. and that would have shattered his jaw completely. This dinosaur knows how to, uh, knows how to break necks, which is interesting. <laughs> Okay, 
Now, I don't know in this scene if, if the Indominus Rex is trying to kind of talk to these pterosaurs. He's definitely not friends with them, but it looks like he's kind of bossing them about, which is probably just a bit of a creative choice. You get bird impacts on planes. It's not beyond the realms of possibility to, to think that flying through a flock of pterosaurs would go any better. They definitely wouldn't attack it on purpose. They're probably just panicked and scared. Again, these pterosaurs weren't dinosaurs. They were flying reptiles who were around at the same time as the dinosaurs. And we don't really know if the pterosaurs and their relatives could or would have kind of flocked or flown as a group. We know that most of them would have eaten fish and lived on the coast, perhaps. But we don't have much evidence, again, for how they lived, unfortunately. So we're on to the classic uh, <laughs> Velociraptors and their bike friend. So we're seeing some pack behavior, some hunting behavior, which could, could happen. We see that happen with wolves and other predators, things like that. In terms of being able to run alongside them on a motorbike and kind of work together, I think that's stretching it a little bit, to say the least. Um, it looks cool. I think that's all I can say on that, really. So in this scene, we've got the uh, Indominus Rex talking to the Velociraptors. I think in the film they explain it that they've added Velociraptor DNA at some point along the line <laughs> to this horrible hybrid creature. That doesn't mean, again, that he'd be able to talk to another species. Cross-species communication is very, very rare in the animal kingdom. And I don't really know of any examples off the top of my head. Think how difficult it is to talk to a, your dog. You can just kind of train it in certain words, for example. So the fact that they'd just be able to have this pretty relaxed conversation is, is pushing it also. So in this scene, this is this is meant to be a, a baryonyx. I actually had to look up what this dinosaur was supposed to be in this film because it looks nothing like what we what we know a baryonyx look like. Also, that would have instantly killed it. You can't just take a lava hit to the head. In this film, is not very accurate yet, so this isn't a great example. It's now been hit by lava four or five times. It's it's gone. The heat alone would have killed it. It would have also mainly eaten fish and been like a a marine or. A, river hunter the fact that i had to wait until the end of the film and google what that was meant to be is is is, is not great i'm not sure why they even did that yeah it's a weird a weird choice to make it that lot number two ladies and gentlemen a juvenile allosaurus i mean for a living dinosaur this is the bargain of a lifetime you would be talking hundreds of millions, billions, you know, it's a living dinosaur. This does highlight, however, the, the current kind of thinking behind dinosaurs and fossil dinosaurs as, as a commodity. It's whenever a dinosaur is sold to a private collector instead of a museum acquiring it, it's effectively lost to science and it's it's quite sad but we understand as paleontologists that you know we can't do much about that in terms of private people finding things on their land paying people to dig it up and then selling it you know people like making money if these were in a museum everyone could enjoy them we could do hours and hours decades in some cases of research on these one specimen the value to us is we we, we quite literally can't put a price on it the collections that we have in various museums museums are, are priceless because of their research value and the scientific knowledge we can gain from them. So this this is getting more and more appropriate to, to current times where, where dinosaurs, dinosaur fossils are being sold for huge sums of money. And unfortunately, museums are often funded by donations and we can't compete with the private market. So it's something that we have to keep an eye on and try not to encourage too much. So 
So yeah, I, I think the the new the Jurassic World films are very different to their the original trilogy. I think they they've gone in a different direction of experimenting more with the genetic side of things and trying to create the biggest and baddest and scariest thing. I think that was perhaps an error on their part in uh, going too far down that way of, of just making Frankenstein monsters. I'm hoping you know that the, the the newer film will maybe go back to its roots a little bit and have some some cool just dinosaur action. That's all we really want. Ultimately, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it wasn't for uh, the Jurassic Park franchise as a whole. The interest and the attention that they've given dinosaurs have made paleontology and dinosaur research what it is today. Yeah, so without those films, I think a lot of people, certainly my age and younger, would, would not be into dinosaurs at all. By having us all come in with this interest from these films, We've, we've progressed the field of paleontology um, probably more than it would have without. So overall, positive. For more expert reacts, make sure to watch our previous video with Joe, where he breaks down scenes from the Jurassic Park trilogy.